dinner time. Not without the farm. Not without water. Fertile ground. Or machines to plow it. Not without safe leaving. Distribution. And a top up. Every now and then. Not without the wholesaler. The retailer. Or the bank that banks the mall. Dinner time. Not without business. Stand it back. It can't be. Welcome to the second of a four-part Standard Bank SME Summit in partnership with Business Day. My name is Pavlo Fatidis. I am an author. I am a business founder. I work with business owners across four countries. And I hope today to share with you some remarkable insights with a remarkable panel around some remarkable challenges that we all face. I hope you managed to take what we shared with you in the first event, which was all about mindset. Mindset matters because what we do and how we do it governs what we get, the result of everything we experience. And our mindset leads us in all our behavior. Positive action is key to growing a business in a no-growth economy complicated by COVID issues and unreliable electrical supply. You'll notice I said growing a business because growth can be gotten in any environment with the right mindset. Today, we are going to be talking about how to reset your business to be relevant in an economy that is very different to the one that we first experienced almost a year and a half ago. That relevance matters to get you ahead of where you are today. What's clear is that what worked before COVID is unlikely to work today and therefore tomorrow. The crisis of COVID changed the status quo of everything and everyone. And resetting your business to be relevant in this change is essential to your survival and growth. The next two events that follow on from today will be about how to rebuild a business that's been well reset. And then finally, how do you reignite a reset business that you have rebuilt to race ahead of competitors and your own expectations? I see we have some very, very interesting parties joining us. Antron Hendricks, CEO of Prestec, 30 years in tool making. This supply chain issue being faced across the automotive industry must have opened doors for you. Zola Sondolo, MD of Sondolo and Knopp Advertising, a full services advertising business. Hey, I've got a great panelist for you to engage with who lives and breathes in your industry and has taken remarkable advantage of the opportunities opened up by COVID. And Aaron Kohle, CEO of FarmSol, agricultural services linking emerging farmers into the food and beverage sector. I'm sure, Aaron, you approve of the new Standard Bank ad, which we saw showing the journey all the way from the table of your and my dinner through to the farm that supplied that food. I welcome all of you today, and I'm very excited to be sharing some new insights that we have gleaned and gained from having worked with a number of businesses that have survived on the other side. Oh, I see Michael Glazer, CEO of Diamond World. Michael, you must be very excited about the new Debswana diamond. I think it was found three weeks ago, the third biggest diamond ever at 1,098 carats. Welcome to you all. We also have Alta Havenha. <laughs> Alta, I see 20 years established in multi-store uh, Oma Sokumbes. You must have had some turbulent times. I'm sure things have not been easy for you. Folks, we're going to share with you the insights on how to reset a business and to make it relevant in the economy going forward. With that, I'm going to begin immediately by talking around questions that I'm expecting from you. Please submit them 
You'll see on your screen, there's an opportunity to put questions. Put questions to the panel I'll be introducing. It's right there on the streaming page. Think about questions you'd like to have answered. And with regard to that, we will try our best to get to all of them. Take advantage of what you see on the screen. Take advantage of my panelists that are going to be helping me extract all these strategies around how to reset a business because they themselves have survived an incredibly tough period having built remarkable businesses that have sustained the COVID lockdown and are moving to the other side of growth. We will answer as many as we can. With that, we need to begin with a fresh perspective. And the perspective always is around how do you look at your business in order to make it resettable? Tools need to be practical. And the very first tools that I want to start talking about is that we need to understand two things. The first thing we need to understand is our businesses themselves. You know, when you start a business, when you run a business, when you're growing a business, when you're under tremendous pressure from a COVID lockdown or from a crisis that you might be facing, it becomes profoundly emotional. With a clear mindset and with distance from the business, separating yourself from it, the opportunity to use a tool that will help you understand what counts and what doesn't count is essential. From there, you need to understand your customers. A customer is a complicated creature. It is the reason why our businesses exist. Without them, there is no business to be done. The first tool I'm going to be sharing with you is going to be centered around a very complicated process that is so complicated, it's not taught at the biggest business schools globally. Harvard doesn't talk about it. Stanford University doesn't even share it. It is a tool worth ten, tens of thousands of rands. And it's a tool that's used to help big businesses simplify because a simple business is a scalable business. In order to get this right, what we're going to do is cook something up. And with that, I'm going to introduce to you the onion method. A simple onion. We've all seen one. Some of us eat them. Most of us should. And using this onion, we're going to turn a complicated, noisy question and answer it in a simple, clear insight. A number of years back, I met the new CEO of Anglo-American at a cheese and wine function. We were having a relaxed conversation and he asked me what I thought of Anglo-American. It was a terrible moment. I'd had a sip of wine to be social and I don't drink. You can imagine what was going on in my head. Spinning and reeling, I blurted out, I think it's like a big fat onion and went on to explain why. So let me do the same for you. If we take the onion and slice it down at center, what we'll notice is that there are a number of different layers to the onion. We have the inner center, we have the middle layers, and then finally we have the outer layers in the skin. Now, if you consider your business as one would look at an onion, and we say that in the, minute, in the inner layer, which is the core strategic, the most important elements of your business that you need to own and guard and hold and dominate in order to deliver the service you deliver. Think of it like this. If you are a data business that takes information and turns it into insight, what do you need that's core and strategic to your business without which, if you don't have it, you don't have a business? Well, in the data business, you need a couple of things. You need statistical capability to turn numbers into story. You need software that enables that process. You need the technology and the software to make it so. You need the skills. So in your business as a data business, those three elements, the skills, the technology by way of software, and the ability to storytell, core and strategic to your business. Without those skills, you don't have that business. We then have the second layer, 
And that's where the burn comes in. And the burn and the sweetness of the inner layer gives the flavor of the onion. In that second layer, you need to ask yourself, what is strategic to my business, but not core for me to own or dominate? So let's go back to our example. Think of it from this point of view. Do I need to own all my hardware? The hardware that runs the software, the computers, the printers, the hard drives. Do I need to own that technology? Do I need to be expert at managing that technology? Or could I outsource that to a provider whose core inner onion expertise and capability it is to manage and control and organize that technology for me? Do I need to be an expert at brand management? Every business needs a brand. Every business needs to have a feeling, a sense, an ethos of its brand and what it represents for its identity. Well, no, you don't need to have expertise in branding. It is absolutely strategic to the value of my business to have a good brand, but it's not core for me to own the skills necessarily to manage that brand. That middle layer represents everything, not core, but strategic to your success. And in that environment, what you're looking for are strategic partners, organizations who are expert at delivering that and can do so on long-term relationships where they get to understand you, understand your business, and you both invest in amplifying those elements of your business. The final layer, the outer area, the outside area. Well, we don't eat the skin. We discard the skin. And that is everything in your business that is not core to your success, nor, quite frankly, strategic to your success. So think of stationery. You don't need to own a stationery business in order to acquire the stationery. When you need the stationery and you acquire the stationery for your business, you're looking for a provider who can give you the best price with the most reliable delivery. And on that basis, you're looking for short-term engagements and you're looking to buy largely on price and assurance of service and delivery. Three layers to the onion. Core and strategic, the essence of what makes your business work. Those elements you never give up, you never outsource, and you need to own and dominate them. The middle layer, strategic to your success, but you don't have to own them. And that's where you need to find the right partners, the right strategic partners, a branding agency, an IT services provider, whatever else it might be, and forge good relationships for medium long-term gain. And then the outer layer, that's the stuff that if you have it inside your business, you can shed it. Because when we are looking to reset our businesses, we want to simplify right down to the essence of what gives our business its distinctive flavor and ability to satisfy and please our clients and customers. A few lessons from the simple onion. Now that we understand what's important in our businesses and what we need to excel and thrive, we need to understand who we serve as customers and clients and what matters to them. To get this right, we break up the market into groups who have similar needs and wants so that we know how to find them, talk with them, sell to them, and service them. So everyone is doing it, and yet it's not what I've seen win. Over the last decade, the winners have taken a different approach. Winners have gone further than the right product and the right price, and have found their growth in the circumstances of the groups that they opted to serve. This means that they see their businesses as expert in understanding the customer problem that they solve and how to create a great experience in getting that job done. None of us spend money on anything that doesn't solve a problem. And because there are many competitors who can solve our problems, we choose to work with the service that gives us the best experience. The trick here is to understand what this experience ought to be. And the answer relies on your ability to hold a conversation with your customers and have them tell you. This means you need to switch from a transaction-based conversation to a relationship-based conversation. Let's make this practical. And to get it right, 
I'm joined by Mapaseka Mokwele, Relationship Life and Executive Coach at Bashumi Fixes. Mapaseka, thank you for being with us. I'm so pleased to have you join us. Thank you very much. So, Relationship Coach. That's it. Where do I begin when I'm looking for a date? If I'm out there in the market, mm. how do I start a conversation that doesn't immediately go to the essence mm. of why I want to date somebody in order to build an environment so I can A, be sure that I've understood them and have them share with me their needs and wants? I think step one looks at competitive advantage. So would you date yourself? That's where you start. Would I date me? If, you're, if I were a business, would I buy my own service? Would I buy my own products? That's where you start. So you start looking inside and looking at what you want before you, start, before you go outside and find what's out there. Because there's a lot of things that are out there. But if you have no clue what you're looking for, you're going to end up going everywhere else and wasting time, wasting money, wasting resources. And burning your brand, and burning, burning your social capital. That's exactly it. So you start inside, you look at what's your competitive advantage, what makes you different, what makes you tick, what makes you special, what is it about you that I would want to look at and think, now that person I would date as opposed to the guy next to him. So if I'm saying, hey, listen, I have a great haircut, is that enough? No, that's not enough. You know, Seth Gordon has a very interesting book um, called The Purple Cow. And he talks about if you go to the countryside and there's like lots of cows that are just, you know, you're driving for miles and miles and all you see is just cows and you're expecting them to be brown cows. What cow is going to stand out there? The and one he, that isn't. Exactly. And he talks about the purple cow and he says, you must be the purple cow. So you want to look different. You want to be different. And I'm not talking about your haircut being different to the next guy, but I'm talking about you being yourself. You're already unique. That's already your special superpower. You're already unique. So you don't have to work hard in trying to change that. Just know who you are and hone in on that one. Again, go to the core of that onion. Know your, know your core and know who you are. Then that way, you don't have to worry about getting the stationery and being the stationery owner and, 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 and. Everybody else just plugs into you but you are still the core business. Okay, so firstly, I need to understand myself. I need to have mm -hmm. the right mindset. I need mm -hmm. to have a good sense of what I have to offer. Mm -hmm. How do I know that what I offer is at the standard that I think it offers? You know, we speak about confirmation biases and all sorts of biases where yeah. we might tend to overvalue ourselves yeah. in relation to the reality of what it is that we do have and we do offer. Mm -hmm. So to get you talking to me, because as a business owner, it's essential I understand yeah. what you want and what you value, as opposed to what I think I have yeah. and what I believe you should value. Yeah. And that goes to understanding your market. So you need to, before you even launch the business, you need to know the market that you're entering into. Same thing goes with dating. Before you approach somebody, understand who you're approaching and why you're approaching this person. So a simple example is you could be, you know, you could be looking at a, at a person and thinking, hmm, that could work for me. You're looking at Beyonce. Beyonce's got Jay-Z. Is she available? She's not available. So your market segment becomes very, very important. Are they accessible? Are they available to you? Is this where you want to play? Is this where you want to be? Can they grow with you? Can the market grow with you and where you are going? You will only know that when you know yourself and when you know which market you want to play in. Okay, but now I know myself. I know the market I want to play in. Mm. I need that market to tell me what they want and need rather than me assume yeah. that I know what they want and need. Yeah. And that's the art of conversation. So where does that first conversation begin? And that's the easy part that becomes so difficult for a lot of people. Because it should be simple. It should be the simple things. If you're walking into a gym and you know that this is a person that you like, and you've seen them a number of times, hey, oh, are you doing that? How do you do that? You chat about things that seem comfortable and easy for you. That's how you get in. You don't want to be the freak that comes in and says things and people stop and look at you like, why did you say that? What, why are you commenting about my body size? Why, you don't go there. So you simply talk about the easy, comfortable things about you and get them comfortable with you. And then, in fact, they start telling you before you even ask. You don't have to ask anything. You start asking them about the equipment they're using in the gymnasium. What do you like doing? 
why are you doing that as opposed to that one? And they start thinking, you know, when I actually go spinning as opposed to running, what happens to my knees? And you know, actually, I like aerobics. I don't like doing Zumba. You don't ask those questions, but now you have the information. Okay, you have just exposed the gold. The gold is the way you find out about people is by having a conversation that's led by questions. Mm. And normally when we are desperate and we're under pressure and we want to get a deal done with the client, mm. we tell them why they need us, we tell them why they should take us on board, we tell them about our fantastic product, our fantastic service, our price, all our other reference clients, yeah. before we've understood what matters to them. Yeah. Because if I listen to what you're saying, the only thing that will get your attention is that when I engage with you, if I'm, and uh, your husband won't misunderstand this, if I'm looking to, to have a date with you, I've got to understand what makes you tick, That's it. what matters to you, what's important to you, That's it. so that you feel heard, understood, That's and with that you begin to trust and invest in the conversation that builds the relationship. That's exactly it. And also remember to never oversell. You know, with, with any business and everywhere you go, you want to market yourself. I always say relationships are like, you know, the beginning of a relationship is like a marketing strategy. You, you walk in and you want to sell yourself. You want to go in and say, that, so this is what I can do. But you don't want to oversell. The beauty of it is when people start finding out who you are and the beautiful things around you without you having said much. That's such a valuable insight that, you know, the art of the conversation is not obvious. But to have that conversation and to get this right, we need to understand this word segment because we find our customers in a segment. It's used in business to refer to your customers. We are going to do something different in order to understand it better. And this is something that was also never ever taught at Harvard or Stanford or any other business school globally. To help me, I'm gonna get joined now by an expert an expert in numbers, and an expert in segments. So Danny, you are president of? Cutting Darts Federation. You've been playing darts for a while? Yes, over Is that years. all you do, just play darts, or do you do something? Is that a real job, or do you have a real job? No, that's not a job, I have a job. Oh, you have a job? Yes. But you that's can throw a leisure. darts, right? Yes, I'd uh, like to think so. <laughs> and what is your real job, Danny? I'm an accountant. An accountant who throws darts. So yes. you're good with numbers. Yes. Can I test your dart throwing and number skills? Of course. Okay, so what I'd like to do is you're going to face the dart ball. So let's give it a go. What I'd like you to do now is I'm going to call out a number, but this time round, Danny, I want you to throw at once all three darts. Okay. Okay. And my number to you is going to, of course, be bullseye. Okay. Right. <laughs> and folks, that's what we've learned from this. That if you try and be everything to everyone, all the time, at once, every time, you land up with only one dart hitting the dartboard. Let's take a closer look at the dartboard itself. Think of this as your market opportunity. These are all the businesses in South Africa. Think of the bullseye as government, the biggest customer in our land. And think of the next ring around it and the following rings around it being corporates to big businesses, to medium-sized businesses, to small businesses, to micro-enterprises. Now, look at the dartboard. There are 20 numbers around the dartboard itself. Think about each number being a sector in our economy. 20 can be mining. Number one can be financial services. Number 18 can be the leisure industry. All of these slices here are the sectors. And all of these slices have businesses operating through them. What is essential about understanding who you serve is to not be everything to everyone, but rather say, I want to become expert at targeting the hospitality sector, slice number 18. 
And within it, understand where you play. If you're a small business and you're doing a million rands of turnover a year, to expect to serve the biggest players in the corporate hospitality sector is really hard. Rather look for medium-sized players who will see value in you and rather look for medium-sized players that you know with what you have and what you do, you can serve them well. Segmentation is about saying, I don't want to be all things to all people. I would rather specialize in one or two sectors. And within those sectors, I know exactly which clients I'm going to target. Getting that decision made is one of the toughest decisions we all face in business. But it's essential to make you expert at not your product, not your price, not your segment, but in creating a brilliant client experience. Because it's the experience that brings customers to you and keeps them with you. Remember, the product or service solves a well-defined problem for your customer. And the way you operate your business creates the experience that they would want to support you. Let's understand how to get this right. And to do so, I'm going to lean heavily on a panel of business owners who've achieved remarkably well in terrible conditions that we all experience today. Keith Govender, a formal naval officer and executive director of Ancora Enterprises. Followed on with Keith, Trinity Mohlame, director of the Media Connection. And lastly, Bruce Turner, founder and CEO of the Bespoke Amenities Company. I'd like to start with you, Keith, a formal naval officer. If anyone knows about sailing ships, and if anyone understands what it must be like to sail a ship in a storm, it's got to be you. How did you get into the Navy, and what sort of ships were you sailing? Well, thank you, Pablo, for having me on the show. I do apologize for my voice uh, as we go on. Um, I joined the Navy in uh, 1990 when uh, my neighbor was in the Navy, and he inspired me to join the Navy, of which I then followed through. And uh, the ships that I served on uh, were basically the Strycraft, the uh, South African Naval Strycrafts. I served on the SES Tafelberg for a short while. And, um, and then I was also, so I did some time on the SES Drakensberg and then back to Strycraft again, where after I was sent to Germany to sail back the, uh, the new frigates. I did my training on the first one. And I was the very first navigator on the third frigate, the SAS Biunkop. And that was a great honor for me to have sailed her back. Yeah, I can imagine. You know, Keith, we've always argued that sailing a ship is like building a business. You need to have a destination. You need to know where you're going to. You need to have a crew that does the right thing at the right time. You need to have systems that operate the, the, um, uh, the ship itself. You need all of that. You need absolutely all of that. And I'm pretty confident that you would have witnessed uh, what's called the terrible, the terrible engagement, the terrible marriage of seas in South Africa. You've got the Indian Ocean, uh, which is warm. It meets the Atlantic Ocean, which is cold, and it creates terrible, terrible storms. I'm sure you've sailed through some of them. And in doing so, Keith, how do you sail safely? What do you expect your crew to do? And how do you navigate in a rough, tough storm? Well, in a, in a rough storm like that, uh, one would expect everyone to take all safeties into, into, uh, into action. So in other words, all your hatches are closed and everyone's alert, very alert, especially your, uh, uh, your watch that's uh, awake and uh, navigating the vessel. And we will basically steer the vessel away from any dangerous uh, areas where such as rocks or, um, or incoming vessels as well. So we try and keep a safe course as much as possible and continuously fixing the vessel to make sure that you're safe. On the strike crafts, it wasn't all that easy because of the, um, uh, the, the way the vessel was designed. So all our watches were pulled on the outside and only the operations team worked on the inside. So you were permanently wet in a storm. But it's, it's basically persevering through that time 
that kept us going and working as a team and relying on one another's strengths during that process that got us to get through that storm safely. So we basically learned to trust one another. And that trust is essential because the word there that was key is a team. And in team, from a navigation point of view, from captaining a ship, it means you need to know what your team is doing and your team needs to be running a set, a set, a, a set of systems, activities that are predictable and reliable so that you can lead and navigate the ship back into safety. Bruce, I'd like to come to you. The Bespoke Amenities Company. Now, I remember your very, very early stages when you first started the Bespoke Amenities Company. We're going back how many years now? It's about eight years now. It's about mm -hmm. eight years. Yeah. And eight years ago, you decided, if I'm not wrong, to do something crazy. You decided to start a soap factory to create a commoditized product where China was our predominant supplier, where price is everything. How has it gone? Where were you before COVID? Well, um, the soap factory specifically was for the hospitality industry. Um, Ouch, we, that's a big storm yeah. that hit you. We, and we were really a very focused hospitality supplier. So, so that was our segment. And um, we were going along nicely. We had, um, we've, we had moved into a really great new factory. Um, we had a, a strong workforce, 150 people. We were supplying some of South Africa's best and best known hotels. And um, yeah, COVID struck and everyone closed their doors the next day. So it was a, a, a hell of a storm. I would imagine in those cases, the reset in your business about understanding what matters and what doesn't. If I think back to the onion method, you must have been under an enormous amount of pressure because you're facing an enormous overhead. You have 150 people that you've got to pay every month. You have, if I'm not wrong, a five, 6,000 square meter facility. We had ESKIM related issues and electricity drives your machines and capability to function and operate. How did you approach from an onion point of view, your business? Um, it, there were so many complications. Um, one of the biggest ones for us was supply chain because you have to fuel the factory with all the different components. Um, at the same time, we had to look at what we could make and, and where else we could supply it because the hospitality industry had completely closed. So fortunately, we manufacture. So um, we have we have a really great team. We've got good chemical engineer. Um, so we were able to start manufacturing sanitizers and disinfectants and, and products that, that were really um, sought after at the time. But that was a very small window. Um, there was a big shortage initially and, and that really helped us get through. So manufacturing sanitizer was, was great. In fact, Standard Bank, surprisingly, were one of our, our biggest um, customers during that period, which, which really helped us. Um, so that was our short-term fix, was to stick to our, our manufacturing. Those are products we knew well. Sanitizers we knew well from the water shortage in Cape Town um, a couple of years back, um, where that became a necessity in hotels. So we got onto those quickly, and then we started working on our supply chain, which was going to be our biggest challenge, getting, getting components. Now, Trinity, I would imagine in your business, the media connection, your supply chain is essential. Your supply chain really is made up of uh, very large advertisers. Tell us a bit about the media company. Which area of media do you specialize in? What does the media company do? And before COVID, what was the world like? Uh, thank you, Pablo. Uh, the biggest asset that a media company does is to enable consumers get info, get um, content that is relevant, that can make them change their behavior. And, and these consumers you find through the community radio stations, am I right? You serve community radio stations. Our core competency is community uh, markets. Uh, consumers or communities, even constituencies, depending on what kind of a business that you operate in. And during that time, when, when COVID started, it was a big hoo-ha. And a lot of big companies, obviously, we know that when they cut budgets, the first place to look at would be advertising. Correct. And we had a responsibility to say, in as much as you are cutting on 
advertising budgets. COVID is an information-related uh, 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 pandemic. When people know, it's easier for them to relate and then they can also behave differently towards the pandemic. We had to communicate. So what we did as the Media Connection was to say, um, how do we then get the messaging across to consumers in a language that they understand, even at dialect level? And remember, generic messaging can be lost somewhere. But if you communicate even through the culture that people are li live through on a daily basis, it makes it easy for them to adapt to the message and the message retention becomes longer. And that's one of the big keys because I would imagine, well, in fact, I know we saw, we witnessed this, that the amount of fake news that was being promoted across social media and misinformation, all of a sudden through a community radio station, because you've tapped into that community, because you have a deeper and more profound relationship and understanding of the culture of that community, it creates what my Paseka was saying earlier, a voice that shows understanding, that shows identity, a voice that builds trust. And in many ways, that was the opportunity that opened up for you. All of a sudden, landing good quality information to build trust and confidence in a community built the value of the community radio station for your advertisers. Remember, um, Pablo, what is key here is when, when people understand what is at stake and what affects them, it enables them to react positively. But the messaging is key. Community radio is one of the best tools to communicate because remember the, la the language beyond the fact that it's dialect, it's even at doorstep level. So when somebody speaks on a community radio, that person is known and they become a soft ambassador. Therefore, they are even able to you know, convert the message in a way that is understood by their own communities, and it makes it easy. And we, what we did was to expose even various platforms within communities. People were, during COVID, other stations were actually even buying pipes, water pipes to connect and making sure that there's water inside their own communities, away, to do, away from broadcasting. But because of these were projects that communities did, we took all of this information, we then populated it on multimedia for clients to see, even other people to see that there's an opportunity to communicate, but communicate purposefully because we have a pandemic and now we need to get the message across for people to change behavior. Mapaseka, this goes right back to what we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, when everything's fine, yes, 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 you listen to a few things, you have communication, uh, when you're not under pressure, when you're not stressed, when things are going well for you, very often when you talk with someone, yes. you're talking with someone with a view to ask a question, and as they answer the question, you're more interested in thinking about what your reply is going to yeah. be than hearing what's being said. I think when you're under pressure, when you face crisis, and when you face conflict, if you can calm your mind, it leads to a better conversation, right? The strongest tool you, you can ever have is your mind. And in fact, if you can work on your mind, then you're halfway there. Um, the problem with getting into situations where you are so stressed that you can hardly answer or, or at least talk to what you, what you want to talk about is that you lose out on everything else. Remember, half the time, you never get a second opportunity. You've got that one opportunity to get this customer and get it right. You've got this one opportunity to get this person and give them exactly who you are and tell them the service that you want to provide, or in our case, at least, tell this person who you are and what you can give them in terms of dating, why they, it would benefit them to date you. One chance. And if you're sitting there and you're nervous and because you don't know who you are and because you've never checked on who and where your space is and where you want to go, where you want to be, it throws you off. Yeah. And I think what's worse is um, when you're in a situation where you don't recognize that the world has changed mm. and you don't recognize that pre-COVID, the way your customers behaved, what mattered to them, what counted for them, is going to be significantly different because the problems in their lives are now different. That's what COVID did. And Keith, Ancora really centers on providing services at ports. Can you talk to us a little more around what Ancora does and what services you were providing? And specifically, what was life like at ports before COVID?
Keith, are you with us? Okay, we have a, tempor a temporary freeze from Keith. Keith, are you with us? I see you back again. I'm back again. Here we go. Yes. So my question to you is, what was life like at the ports before COVID? Well, look, uh, Encora Enterprises, uh, based on the part that I got before we got frozen there, uh, is a maritime services providing company, and uh, we provide services in ports in other countries as well. And during uh, prior COVID, uh, we were doing a lot of foreign work in foreign ports, which was bolstering us very well and, and placing us well in the marketplace as a, as a company. However, obviously, when the when the, the lockdown happened on March 26, 2020, uh, all the borders closed, so we couldn't travel. And I even had uh, a guy stuck in uh, Congo, which I couldn't get out. I only managed to get him out two months later on a repatriation flight back to South Africa. We were doing local work. We, we do a lot of government work uh, for Arms Corps, uh, which is in support of the Navy. Um, and uh, that was also increasing, but uh, during the lockdown, obviously everything died down as well. And the port itself, uh, it became like a ghost town, if you want to call it that. You know, uh, there wasn't much activity. Um, and, uh, but fortunately, we were blessed to classify ourselves as an essential services provider. So we were able to support, for example, the fisheries patrol fleet, which belongs to the Department of uh, Environmental Affairs, Forestry and uh, Fisheries. And, uh, and we also did some work with the Navy over that period as well. But uh, in a nutshell, the, 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 the lockdown had a major impact on the maritime industry. Uh, some companies even closed their doors. But by the grace of God, we, we hung on and uh, still, still hanging on and pushing through with bigger plans ahead of us. You know, it takes a remarkable um, amount of insight and foresight, Bruce. I can imagine. All of a sudden, you had your turnovers fall by up to 70%, you mentioned to me. Yeah. 75% was the worst. Yeah. And right around the media. Am I right, Trinity? Everyone was talking about this word pivot. You need to pivot. And a whole lot of people went into the area of providing hand sanitizers. Mm. I had companies, a lot of businesses that I work with, that suddenly decided they were going to go into PPE. They were going to manufacture all sorts of hand sanitizers, surface sanitizers. But pivot doesn't mean that. Pivot means that you need to really look at what Mapaseka was saying earlier, or building on the onion method, at what's core and strategic to your capability and to build out from there. You went into sanitizers, but you had the means to do it, correct? Yeah, we, we were fortunate. We, we had a factory already in place. It was an easy product for us to do, um, and that tied us over. But th that was never going to be the, a long-term um, solution for us. Um, you, you know, that, that, that was a short-term fix. So it was a short-term fix, but in the meantime, when there's a crisis of any sort in a business, depending on the kind of crisis it is, if we look at the COVID pandemic, it was universal. Not one person was unaffected by it. True. A lot of us thought that the three-week lockdown would be a temporary lockdown. And yet here we are a month, a, a year, and what, two, three months down the line, and there's still no end in sight with further restrictions appearing on the horizon. In those circumstances, you must have had to make some tough decisions with your staff and your employees. How did you approach it? Yeah, I mean, initially, everyone hoped it was going to be the three-week lockdown. I think um, one, one of my sayings that I love so much is only the paranoid survive. So I had this this inkling that that wasn't going to be the case. So we had to reduce headcount. I mean, when you're a factory, you've got a lot of people. Our costs were 70% of our cost is, is people. There wasn't work for them. So we, we had to reduce our workforce, which is just awful. It's the worst thing, worst thing I've ever been through. I hated it. You know, I know your history. And I know that before you started your particular business, you came to see me. And one of the ideas you wanted to get into was exactly that, human capital. Mm. Your argument to me, I remember this nine years ago, was, Pablo, we are sitting in a country that doesn't understand mining. And I turned around and I said to Bruce, well, what do you mean you don't understand mining? And he said to me, 
We think that the value in South Africa lies in the ground. I think the value lies in people. And I want to start a business to get the value out of people in order to build the economy in the country. Bruce, it must have been really tough for you mm. where you specifically built a factory to employ to then have to let go of people that you have built relationships with. Yeah, it was, it, it was terrible. And, and you know, the, the worst is it's, it was out of those people's hands. If it was a case of we had seen the business deteriorating for other reasons, but these were, this was a really competent workforce. So people who did their jobs well, produced a great product, they had a, we had a market for it. Um, and it was through no fault of, of the workforce. And, and that, that was particularly difficult. Trinity, it must have been tough in your environment as well, because creative skills, capabilities are not easily found. They're not easily nurtured. It takes time to build them. It takes time to build the confidence of people who produce the content that is your bread and butter, essentially. How did you approach your people issue? We, we were so lucky because uh, the captain, who is the CEO of the company, is extremely passionate with people. And the first direction that we had to take was to say, let's secure our value assets, which people is. So what we did is we looked at within our inventory, uh, what is it that we have that could add value to the core business? And in that case, we had our own radio, I mean, our own uh, production studios. We had a pool of more than 280 radio stations, which means there's talent on the other side. So relationships played even a better role in that manner. And the thing that we did during that time was to be available for our clients. When everybody was working from home, not uh, being contactable, we were available and we, we took a stand to say, let's do a hashtag, we are here, where are you? And then we started letting everybody know that we are here. You know, let's communicate, let's use what we have to benefit you. We gave more than we asked and we started exposing the services that we have from a 360 point of view. And that helped customers come to us and say, can you translate? Can you do voiceovers? Can you do this? And the answers were all yes, without even having to, you know, uh, bulk up the price. And that on its own created even a better relationship and trust with, between us and our stations and the clients. And that helped us. You know, I love, what, I love the way you've just put that. Because, Keith, it reminds me of what you said earlier around making sure that your team is with you in sailing the boat to safety or sailing the ship to safety. How many new ideas came to your mind when you, because you must have been one of the people who saw the impact of COVID earliest. If I think about it, it started in the East. It shut down China, which is the world's supply chain. And you must have seen a cooling off at ports already. You must have seen a cooling off of movement. To what degree did you make your decisions independently? And to what degree did you speak to your team located in the ports who had a lived reality of what was going on in order to reset your business and keep it afloat and moving? Well, in all honesty, Pablo, it, it, it hit us the hardest when the borders closed. And then I realized that the business model I had at the time wasn't, wasn't enough to support the team that I had and the, and the operations. Uh, so I had to then, uh, as I told my team, we had to tap dance a little bit and uh, start focusing our attention on the local, local market. And uh, we went out on a huge um, drive on uh, um, applying for tenders, believe it or not. And uh, we, we now, and with that time, we won the tender where Ancora now runs an entire key space in Cape Town, uh, known as Hamlet Key, where we birth vessels and we provide services to vessels there as well. So that uh, started assisting as a, as an income generator for the company. And on top of that, the engagements with local companies started to increase. We started being more visible and more present in people's offices and, and, and yards and so on. And, um, and you know, we're now starting to get that element of, we are around and this is what we can do. So we are being used more and more, which is by, by the grace of God, we're thankful for that. Uh, yes, you're right. We did see it coming and, and saw it coming very fast, but the, it, at the rate at which it happened, it was too late to try and change everything at that time. 
So we just had to manage the situation as was. And uh, with that, um, we put other plans in place, which I'm happy to share with as we go through the session, but uh, those plans will then basically secure our place in industry going forward, um, even if there's a, another pandemic of this nature coming about. Well, you know, I think the reality is, uh, one of the arguments I was putting forward, Keith, is that pre-COVID, there were three levers of change globally that were going to change the way things worked. Uh, the first is climate change, the second is technology, and then the third internationally that we're seeing globally is, let's call it economic exclusion, where many people in the small, medium business space feel more and more left out of the economy, and that's causing a whole lot of disruption politically, which we have noticed. And, you know, there's a lovely expression I read, Keith, something that you as a former Navy uh, commander would have understood and perhaps uh, appreciated. You only learn to sail in storms. You don't learn to sail in smooth waters. So the ability to pivot, the ability to change what you were doing, recognizing a changed environment, in order to be relevant in that changed environment and through that generate income and revenue to keep your team is essential. But Trinity said something. And Mapaseka, I want to come back to you about this because there's nothing worse than not knowing what to do and what to say when you are being looked upon by your team for leadership and guidance. Mm. How do you, do you fake it? You start with honesty. To lead any team, you've got to be sincere. They've got to trust you. They've got to know that you stand your word and actually that you can actually come back and say, guys, I was wrong. Should you make that mistake? But is that the case? Because if your team is concerned, and, and let's face it, everyone was profoundly concerned around what COVID meant for them specifically. Mm. Mm. They were concerned and remain concerned about will I have a job tomorrow? Will mm. I have a job next week? Mm. And That's as a business leader, you are being looked upon by your team for certainty. And as a business leader, you've invested in that team. You need them to be with you. You need them to stay the course yeah. with you. How, did, how do you begin to bridge that gap when you don't know what to do? You don't know what to do, but you need to communicate. Remember, we say this in all relationships, business relationships and out of business. Communicate, communicate, communicate. So you let them know where you are, what is happening, what is coming. There's a storm coming. I don't know how far this is going to go. This is COVID. We're told three weeks. This is what we anticipate. If it is three weeks, let's predict. If it's three weeks, this is what could happen. If it's six weeks, this is where we could go. If it's a month, this is what it could mean for the business. But if you have worked ahead and you come back and you're actually honest and open to the people that, are, that you are leading, then they have trust and respect for you. And, and they know that you, 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 they can trust your word. So what you're saying is that to be trusted and respected, you don't have to always be right. No, you don't. You don't always have to be right. Um, you have to be honest and you have to be willing to acknowledge when you have done wrong or said wrong. Uh, but you have to at least, you know, to lead, you're walking with them. This whole thing of thinking that you're leading because you're far ahead of people and they must come behind you. Sometimes they can't be far, away, uh, far ahead of you. Sometimes to lead, you have to be behind them and make sure that everybody's there. Excuse me, make sure that everybody's actually part of the pack and you, have, you haven't left anybody behind. That's still leading. Bruce, how did you have conversations with your team that I know you're very, very attached to about the environment that you were facing? Because let's face it, nobody knew what it meant. and from week to week in the beginning, and then month to month down the line, circumstances changed, and commitments you might have made a week ago, a month ago, now need to be broken because circumstances are fundamentally different. So what you told your team that they held on to a week ago, a month ago, you're now telling them something different. How did you lead that process with your, with your staff? Um, I think always very open to the fact that I didn't know. Um, and I was, that was the truth. The truth is we sat down, none of us knew, and, and we were honest about that. But we shared a lot of information. So we made sure everyone could see all the information, was aware of what's happening. And, um, and when the time got there and we had to have 
tough discussions. Everyone knew the base we were coming from. There was no, it, it didn't come as a surprise. It wasn't sort of out the blue. Um, and, you know, it, retrenching staff is, is awful. Um, but with that information, it was amazing. Some staff came forward and said, um, my spouse is working, we can afford it. I'm prepared to take a package. Um, and things like that really helped. So I think what we were is, is, is honest. We, we were showed our vulnerability and we shared our information and um, there was not much else. Yeah, there is not much else. And Trinity, I'm guessing in those cases, the way you spoke to your team the conversations you had with your customers must have been very different in the first six, seven, eight months of that COVID lockdown period. How did those conversations change? And specifically from your team, when you understood the essence of your business, in other words, the inner core of your onion, what is strategic and core to your capability is to relate and transmit information to communities. When you identified that, as your reason for being, the conversations you had with your team, did they come up with ideas on products and services that you could then offer community radio stations as well as advertisers? Pablo, the best brand is a brand that listens to its consumers. And in, when somebody articulates a problem, trust me, there's actually a solution in that problem. Your responsibility as a conduit is to find out how can I make this person's life better? But I also need to say this, history and experience is the best teacher. When you as a leader come on board and call a staff meeting for argument's sake and start communicating a certain message, remember these people have known you before that meeting. So how you carry yourself throughout the running of the business creates basically an identity of your leadership and a personality in your leadership style. So honesty and you striving to be trusted by people that are, are, are being led by you is key. So you lead from the first day, not the day there's a crisis. So what I'm trying to say is even the brands that you represent, they need to know that you, you are, you've got integrity, you are trusted, and you can be available when you are needed. And you don't just change as per the situation. You stand your ground and your core product or your core being is known. So you can't give what you don't have. We are a community radio platform and a conduit. We, we were that, but we just augmented on a couple of things around what we can do more. But the basic core was we can give you mass market in communities using community radio. We kept on communicating that message, but adding other things like your social media, influencers within communities and so forth. But the core product has always been there. And those corporate clients would never have listened or heard what you were saying had it not been for the crisis itself. Yeah. Amazing how a crisis opens opportunities. Mm -hmm. Keith, I want to go back to you because I know that the crisis opened up an enormous opportunity for you. You have secured, if I'm not wrong, an enormous investment from outside of South Africa to do something remarkable inside of South Africa. Tell us a bit about that. Uh, thank you, Pablo. Um, you're right. We, we used the opportunity to engage a uh, foreign entity on, on, on funding for a large maritime project for the Saldana Bay area. Uh, it's going to be within the Saldana Bay Industrial Development Zone, which is the free port of Saldana. And um, uh, we actually started the planning discussions on Monday, which went exceptionally well. And uh, the, the, the funding is, is all in place. Uh, the MOUs have been signed, uh, the LOIs have been done. So we, we're just uh, waiting on the actual uh, final, final straws now so that we can begin construction in the area and set up. Uh, what we're gonna be putting up, Pablo, is basically a shipbuilding facility, quite a large one. And it will also have a ship repair facility as well going into the, into the area. So a project that started off with 10,000 square meters of land is now um, way exceeded that. And we're gonna to have to reclaim land from the sea as well uh, to do what we need to do in, in that area. Job, yep. job capacity, you know, in about uh, four years, 
I'm looking at about 1,100 people, approximately 1,100 people employment, both direct and indirect. You know, that is a remarkable, it is a remarkable, remarkable statement that. So, with all respect, Keith, and I don't mean to diminish you anything else, but here's Keith Govender. He has a business. Very few of us know about him. And through his hand, through his drive, through keeping his eye on the destination that he is sailing his ship to, he has extracted an enormous investment from abroad to create over 1,200, 400 jobs in the next four years that will equally be highly skilled jobs in the area of shipbuilding and welding. All of a sudden, Saldana's world and economy is going to fundamentally change because of the vision and drive of one man. There's another man who's done this too. Bruce, am I right that one of the opportunities you took up was to create a product range that fits with the future trends of climate legislation, that is super efficient, works well in the hospitality hotel sector where you're predominantly focused, but opens up the retail sector too. Yeah, so um, sustainability is a big thing for me, um, something that, that um, I spent a bit of time in lockdown studying and, and we put together an amazing range for City Lodge, which includes what's called a shampoo bar. So a shampoo, your liquid shampoo is typically 80% water. 20% um, would be the ingredients you need. And, and we're shipping 80% water all over the world, which makes no sense from a, a supply chain point of view, from a carbon footprint point of view. Um, you need plastic packaging. And we started developing solid shampoo bars, which is similar to a bar of soap, and you rub it on your hair, and it's got all the same ingredients that you would you would normally have in a shampoo. Um, the feedback from City Lodge's customers were, was fantastic, and, and we developed the formulas more, and um, we've created a retail brand. It's called Zero Bar. Um, it's, it's actually doing really, really well in Hong Kong. <clears throat> um, it's available in the States, and we're rolling it out into clicks in, a, in about a week's time, which is really exciting. And I'm imagining, Bruce, that that opportunity mm. would not have come to fruition the way it did, as quickly as it did, had it been business as usual, with no COVID lockdown. The COVID lockdown must have created an enormous sense of drive and necessity in you to accelerate that process, think out of the box, to put shampoo in a box, and meet the climate legislation that's coming down the pipe globally, and through that open an entirely new sector. Yeah, definitely. It, it, it pushed the project forward a lot quicker than it, it, it would have been. And um, I think the other thing with it, it's um, creating products that people want to be sustainable. People want products, but they don't want to compromise on, you know, okay, it, it's not a shampoo, it's awful to use, but it doesn't have plastic. It was, you know, I believe strongly in concentrated products. I think um, there's a market for them and I think people are, are changing their perception of, of things. That's amazing. <laughs> you know, think about it. Keith has created an opportunity that I think might have been harder to land if we never had the crisis. His funders that he found, the requirements that he had to meet, in order to establish a shipyard might have taken a lot longer had everyone been in a situation where they weren't looking to make things happen. And when a crisis hits and the status quo changes, it means your ability to land a conversation, hold different conversations opens up. I think the same has been experienced by Bruce. Certainly from Trinity's point of view, all of a sudden community radio stations have become front and center for many corporate entities that even recognized where their staff had to go home, away from the inner cities to outlying areas during the COVID lockdown. We're gonna take some questions. There've been some great questions that have been put forward. And I see that our questions that have been running are pointed towards uh, each of us on the panel here today. 
So let's take a couple of your questions. Please carry on submitting your questions and, and let's hear and let's answer what it is that's front of mind for you. You know, Mapaseka, we've been talking about saying good communication is about hearing what's being asked, hearing what's being said. Mm. In terms of one of the toughest questions that I see has come through to you, Mapaseka, how is it that when we talk to our corporate clients, very often they insist on having their cameras off? How do we then strike a relationship and accord with those individuals that we are talking to in order to understand their body language and true intent and meaning when we engage with them? This is something that is so difficult, especially now with, uh, with COVID-19 and everything having to be online. Um, we were talking about it earlier to say, you know, you lose almost the personal touch. So you, you also lose that talking to people. When I'm talking to you and I look the other way, and I carry on talking to you, you don't know if I'm, am I winking at him? What am I doing? What's going on? And you rely on my face to tell you how I'm feeling. You rely on my body to say to you, am I open to what you're saying? If you're going to talk to me and all I do is this, you already know that I'm not interested. So what do I do? What do I do? The question that's come through <laughs> says, how do, I, how do I get my hopeful customer Yeah. Switch your camera on, connect and engage. You again connect, you talk, you talk to your customer. So you continue talking to your customer to a point where they start trusting you. Remember, it's all about trust as well. They start switching on that camera because they also want to see you because now they're starting to have a relationship with you. They're starting to chat with you. They're starting to like what you sound like. So as you're talking to them, even before you switch the cameras on, what does your voice sound like to them? Are you sounding like you're in bed yourself? Are you sounding dead? Are you sounding like you're interested or you're interesting? You know, so all of that comes into play. And people now, we start relying on, um, we start relying on what we're hearing as well. This was what becomes so important to us too, as to, oh, the tone of voice. Are they sounding, is it high pitched? Is it low pitched? Are they, are they happy? Are they sad? How are they feeling? And you start poking at that. So how are you feeling today? How are you doing? Um, oh, you don't sound happy. What happened today? How was your day? How, and then they start telling you, my cat died, and this is what I, I'm feeling, and this is what, what happened. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, but, oh, I'd love to see your face. I'd love to see you. Oh, actually, you now have a date. They switch it on and you start chatting. And getting that date is what it's all about. If you don't get that date, if you don't get that communication going, it's going to be really, really hard to go through the reset process to understand what you need to do differently to win the business. Bruce, a question for you is, how did you get into clicks? I mean, that is an enormous retailer. Is it, did you have a connection there? Did you have a relationship there? What really essentially got you into clicks? Um, realizing that we weren't a company that supplied retail and finding a partner that was an expert in retail and retail supply chains. What does an expert <coughs> in retail mean? Well, um, retail is complicated and, and um, our hospitality business is very different. So we needed to find a partner who had presence in the, st uh, in the retail stores. We needed to find a partner who knew how retailers worked. It's a far more complicated um, arrangement than you would think. So we found the right partners um, who represent a lot of brands and um, they helped us and, and they did the work and, and got us into clicks. So this goes back to the onion method because what you are suggesting is that your core strategic capabilities weren't centered around retail and you went into the middle layer to find someone whose core strategic capabilities were retail and you established a strategic long-term partnership. Exactly, and we focused on the product. See, the onion works. <laughs> Keith, a good question that's come up for you. Are you ready for this? Yeah, sure. And Keith, I have to thank you because I know that you've got terrible, terrible flu. So thank you so much for being with us. I needed to no say problem. that and to amplify it. How did you get the money? The question's straightforward and simple to establish this enormous project in Saldana. Well, basically, I put together a good proposal uh, for, the, for the project. And uh, I was introduced to the financiers. They did a due diligence on myself and the company itself 
and uh, they came down to South Africa and I made them meet the role players here that were part of the whole project. And before they left here, we got the, the thumbs up that the funding was approved. So you also then spent a lot of time and a lot of money nurturing those relationships, building up trust, demonstrating that what you say is what you do and what you want to make happen is something that you have shown make happen in the ports that you currently operate in. Oh, that's, that's very true. And also the fact that um, the projects that we are implementing has huge social responsibility in the area. So it's not only just going to grow the area from a, from a personal perspective as a company or the people that live there, but it's also going to attract more business to move into the area, which means when those businesses move in, they then will start employing more people to work in those businesses to support our business. So it just grows and grows. It has a huge ripple effect in a positive way, no, no negative way attached. Yeah, you know, it's Trinity, I'm going to come to you. There's a great question for you. What Keith has just said is that business doesn't exist on its own. It exists within a community. And if you mobilize a community around your business, there are a number of benefits that you can enjoy from that. The question that's been put to you specifically is, the way you did things pre-COVID and the way you had to do things now post-COVID in order to create the new suite of products and services that you offer community radio stations and advertisers, how did you get your team to change the way they worked? Nothing beats reality. <laughs> and you, you have a knack of such intuitive wisdom in the way you communicate things. It but, is so beautifully put. But it's true. You know, nobody lives in isolation. And even your team itself, they can see that currently the status quo has changed and we need to be agile in order for us to stay afloat. And the, the best thing that we did beyond communication was to also listen to some of our team members. They've got suggestions and they see and they remember they know the business. They've been in this business with you for, for you know, so they are able to even give you insights as to how we can diversify. And it's key for us to listen as leaders. Let's listen to who we think they are followers. They are actually leaders in themselves. And when they give you insights about how we could change as a business, that also adds to even the bigger picture of the business. So listening is also another big tool. And that's a great way to end up our session today. I promised that we would be out at quarter past. What Trinity has just said is to the extent that you engage your team, to the extent that you ask and then listen to hear, means that they become co-creators in the new products and services that can navigate you out of crisis into opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, and the rest of you, thank you so much for joining us in the second of our series. I really hope to see you soon at our next event, where we're going to be talking about how you take a reset business and build it into something that becomes sustainable, that becomes predictable, that becomes reliable. Because once we can get that done right, it means that the opportunity for you to focus on growth and investment presents itself. Please spend more time thinking about the questions you'd like to forward to us. Get them up ahead of the next session. And I really want to thank Standard Bank for being part of this entire engagement at a time where Supporting businesses in South Africa is enormously, enormously important. It's important that what we have shared with you, to the extent that you can, you take and you implement. And the reason you should is because if you don't, nobody else will. Thank you again for investing your time with us, and we shall see you at the event Rebuild. Dinner time. Not without the farm. Not without water. 
fertile ground or machines to plow it. Not without safe keeping. Distribution. And a top up every now and then. Not without the wholesaler. The retailer. Or the bank that backs the mall. Dinner time. Not without business. Stand it back. It can't be. Thank you. Bye, guys. Dinner time.